Holy cannoli. <laughs> Hey, what's up guys? So recently I did a live playtest of my game Blood and Mead with game designer Oliver Joyce. Now in the comments of that video, I got a lot of great feedback from you guys, different things that I could try or implement. Now one of the um, bits of feedback I got was about the um, background which I showcased in that um, particular playtest. The feedback was that maybe it could be like, I think it was more majestic. It's a very valid bit of feedback. So anyways, I went about addressing this. So I thought I'd make a video and take you guys along for the ride and show you the process of how I went about um, making a more majestic, more impactful and ultimately more beautiful background. All right, let's go. So first of all, what is the issue with this original background I have? Is it really that bad? Um, not really. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. Um, but this is the first area of the game. So I kind of want it to be very impactful. You know, the first few minutes with a new player are very important in building an emotional connection to the content. And it's important to kind of um, put a bit of our best stuff on show to kind of hook them in and make them want to play more. It also gives me a way to separate myself from some of the more kind of colorful, hyper-saturated games on the market. You know, in the past few years, I've seen plenty of uh, Viking side-scrollers pop up out of nowhere that are very kind of colorful um, and that's fine but it's not really the direction I want to go. So the first place I like to start my research is good old Google Images. And though the art style of these is very different to my game, it's still very useful in establishing a general tone. Once I find something that catches my eye, I like to bring it into Photoshop and use the eyedropper tool to collect color data from various parts of the image. That color data can then be made into a color swatch which is a useful way of reviewing your color choices for mood. In this case, I'm going for a mood which is, you know, green, but cold and a bit windy. It's important to review these kind of choices against the elements of your game. Replacing the existing background with this swatch is a really good way of doing that. These layers will represent the different background layers of the game. So you can kind of tweak these to find a better resting position. And yes, this means I'm going to have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six, maybe six or seven layers of parallax. This is gonna look sweet. These layers can then be masked off to better resemble the form factor of mountains, forests, and hills, after which high definition versions can be created and refined. In this case, I spent some time in Adobe Illustrator, you know, moving vector nodes around and fighting with tangential continuity. Yes, that's the word which describes uh, this madness. I've got to say, I'm not the biggest fan of Adobe Illustrator. It's a powerful tool, you know, it allows you to create lossless, scalable uh, vector art. But for the most part, when I'm in Adobe Illustrator, I feel like I'm just like a madman in a car about to lose control, you know, driving up the footpath. And I usually cannot wait to get back into Photoshop. <laughs> One of the trickier aspects of creating background graphics is making them seamless or repeat horizontally. This is required because the backgrounds need to be coded to parallax once in the game engine. But I gotta say, it's pretty tedious finicky work and often, even when you think you've got it, you bring it into the game engine and it's like one or two pixels off and it just ruins the whole effect. And you go back into Photoshop, make a little adjustment and yeah. After that comes the fun part of adding more detail with the brush tool. You know, just playing around, adding more definition to the peaks, so they look a bit more visually interesting. I've got to say, this part of the process was actually quite relaxing. As a tip, whenever doing this kind of landscape work, always keep your light source in mind. You can see here I'm adding this left edge light to the side of the cliff to kind of simulate the light creeping over. And then of course you have to actually add that light source. Here I'm doing it using the brush tool, and then uh, making it white. It's subtle, but it's noticeable. And then to finish this effect off, we can add a Gaussian blur to add a bit of depth of field to the scene. You can achieve this same depth of field effect in engine using post-processing or shaders, but I typically try to stay away from that stuff if I can, because over the long course of a project, the more of that stuff you add in, it can lead to performance implications. And because my uh, backgrounds are not going to be utilizing like a distance based depth of field, I'm going to have all the layers on the same Z position. I really don't have to utilize that. I can do everything manually in Photoshop. So the time has come to bring these graphics into Unity, into the engine. And it's always so exciting because you get to see the graphics for what they will look like as a player. It's absolutely brilliant. I've also added a touch of bloom through post-processing. So time for the important step of making this thing parallax. And I did this by creating a parallax script 
with a slider where I can easily change both horizontal and vertical offsets. If you guys want me to make a tutorial on how to go about actually coding this kind of Paradox script, do let me know. It's a topic that has been covered, you know, ad nauseum by different YouTubers over the years, but I suppose it's always interesting to hear a fresh uh, perspective or a different perspective. So yeah, drop a comment, let me know. Oh yeah, that movement is looking really cool now. And I had to tweak those offset values a fair amount to get it looking right. And it takes time to get that nice, fluid background transitional movement. And this subtle vertical parallax really is the cherry on the cake. I love parallax. And especially this vertical parallax that I've added, it adds so much to the feeling of the world movement. And it is exaggerated. And that's because, um, you know, we're not building a life simulator here. Um, in a real world situation, if you were to stand on a crate and look over the skyline, you're not going to see behind the mountains or distant um, objects. It's not going to happen. It's all going to look fairly static. But in a game, we want to kind of exaggerate these things to make it feel more dynamic. Well, I could have left things there. I really could have, but oh no. John had to take it a step further. I had to add a few trees for good measure because, you know, trees are cool and they add a lot of atmosphere. One thing leads to another and I found myself adding windmills. They're kind of cool because they make the world feel more alive, like, you know, characters might actually live and work there. Well, the grand reveal is finally here. Holy cannoli. <laughs> I'm so I'm so happy I took the time to do this. I really am. I mean, ugh. and this is of course the game I'm working on, Blood and Mead. If you haven't already, please do go drop a wish list on Steam. I'll put the link below. It's going to be a lot of fun, guys. Um, it's a Viking-themed combat adventure platformer, and yeah, it's going to be great. I'm so happy I received that bit of feedback. Else, I would have still been stuck on that other background, you know. And it's a bit of a reminder for other indie devs to be open to feedback. There's a bit of sensitivity in the indie space where people are very precious about their projects and they don't like to hear um, hard truths sometimes, but it's important to take in the good feedback as well as the bad and be able to process both of them and find the kernels of truth that you can apply to your projects. So I hope you found this video interesting and maybe it's given you some insight into how to go about doing this kind of work in your own project. Please do give the video a like. It helps with the, you know, algorithm gods. <laughs> and a big thank you to my Patreon supporters who are continuing to support this channel. I really appreciate you. See you all in the next video. Bye.